Solo Hunters Finding Wild podcast is presented by Global Rescue, the world's leading membership organization providing medical, security, evacuation, travel risk, and crisis management services. These are the people on the ground who have your back and who have the resources to get you out of any sticky situation should the need arise. An emergency evacuation without coverage could cost tens of thousands of dollars, and with Global Rescue membership starting at only 119 bucks, there's no reason to travel without it. Medical and security emergencies can happen, and if they do, I'm putting my trust on Global Rescue, providing medical, security, travel risk, and crisis response anywhere I go worldwide. Go to globalrescue.com slash solo hunter to find out more, and if you do decide that you need a plan, tell them that I sent you and use promo code SOLO at checkout. Big hole. Put on some frozen boots, go tread some frozen tundra. We've got two days of solid pack. Stay on this backside until I get right on freaking top of it. We literally have 45 minutes till the plane is supposed to land. Hey, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Solo Hunter Finding Wild podcast. This week, I'm in Park City, Utah, just getting ready to go in and sit down with um, a couple of new friends that I've met this week. I've followed EJ Varos on Instagram. It's under Pura Bura on Instagram. I followed him for a couple of years and have been impressed by you know a lot of his hunting style and his you know, just the way that he presents himself and everything. And I've really, you know, EJ's listening to this. I've been a fan. Of course, he's a, he was a fan of mine as well, come to find out. And uh, met EJ and his buddy Josh Pasco up there on the shoot. And we've been able to shoot for the last couple of days. And then actually just ran into their other buddy who's here, Ricky Garcia. So I've invited these guys to come and sit down for an episode of the podcast. Um... You know, just to sit down and chat. I've had a great time with them the last couple of days. They're funny dudes. Um, we've kind of worn EJ out hiking around and then just sat down for some dinner. So all of our blood flow is in our stomachs. But if we can liven these guys up and have a good conversation, I think you're going to enjoy it. They're a great uh, cast of characters. So without any further delay, we'll get into this episode with EJ Varos, Josh Pasco, and Ricky Garcia. These guys are studs. Any idea how close we want this? Not in the back of your throat. Yeah, not like it's a <laughs> We're going live, ladies and gentlemen. It is live. It's yeah. already recording? Yeah. I like to start it early because I, I like all the good stuff for myself. So yeah. The funny uh, stuff that's being said. <laughs> I can keep that, but. Edit to the PG 13 side of things. <laughs> I try to keep it PG 13 plus. I don't know what's in between 13 and R, but definitely below R if possible. Yeah. PG-18. So, um, let's go through some introductions first, if we can, real quick. We'll start right here with Josh. Josh, you want to start? Then we'll go to EJ and Ricky. Ricky? Yep. yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, Josh Pascoe, Midland, Texas, West Texas boy. Uh, the other two guys are from South Texas, so. Oh. Is there a difference between people, between West Texas and South Texas? No, they're all you good had to make it a well, point. I, like I was talking to you earlier, it's like I love the state of Texas. Everyone there is friendly. So that's right. Then we got EJ. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, living in Laredo, Texas, and uh, that's it. Ricky, you're gonna have to carry this. So he, oh, yeah, he's a little boring. Oh right, no, exactly. I'm a I'm a I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ranch right. manager. No, wildlife no, I didn't ask about that. Yeah, oh. <laughs> you just want to know where we're from and where we are introductions of who who's here so when somebody hears the voice they're like oh that's ej gotcha ej here's their josh oh there's ricky over there so uh carrizo springs southwest texas big deer country that's my hometown that's what got me into the hunting side of things seeing all the big hunters come in on the holidays or the winter months uh dove season you'd have a whole bunch got a place in san antonio i go back and forth all right they got your voice 
Yeah, they got it. <laughs> yeah. Story's right, you're over. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a little of the introduction. He's he's a little more boring. So we got a little South Texas, West Texas. That's good. I think the problem is 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 we three have spent the day together and and part of yesterday too. So yeah. I think any stories that we've had have already been told, right? Yeah. Oh, good, there's the more good ones. stories. The other problem is all of EJ's blood flows in his stomach right now. Yeah. We just ate oh, it all went out. <laughs> tip of my finger. <laughs> that finger's hurting. That's what it is. Uh, yeah. EJ's a comedian until the mic's in his hands. So. No, I'll roast. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's better at the roasting. That that part, he's really good at that. Good. Yeah. We need it. So, so EJ, Pabura? Pabura? Purabura. Purabura. However. So... um. <laughs> I'm, I guarantee some of you listeners here, some of the listeners will know who you are by Instagram or whatever. Um, some of the hunts you've done with some other people, other shows or other cool big stuff, some things that you've done. I started following EJ a couple of years ago on Instagram because I was like, this guy kills a lot of stuff and he goes on some some cool hunts, big deer. <laughs> Everything he kills is big, generally. And I just, I didn't know anything about you at all, really, other than I liked your page. I liked what you present it you know um and then i met you yesterday for the first time kind of got to know you a little bit that's how i met josh yep so josh i just started following him on instagram same same story you guys are you guys kill a lot of stuff cool oh, cool yeah. things and so i want to talk a little bit about some yeah, of those things we get too. lucky well, you a, get lot, a, a lot of luck yeah <laughs> a lot of luck and you get to hunt a lot too yeah. right or you you make sure that well, you hunt a if lot. you hunt a lot then your odds go up you know so. yeah in and text. then Ricky, I met you today for the first time, so we just kind of roped you into it because I I could tell these guys were a little dragon butt, and then you had a big smile on your face. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I need I need a cleanup man here. Yeah, that's so, right, that's yeah. a good one, cleanup I, man. Appreciate that. Call the guy out of the bullpen. I got this. <laughs> Disclaimer: We're coming off a heavy dinner. So we're Wild thing. Full. Heavy dinner. Fifty targets of yeah, a lot of walking, hiking yeah. here in Utah, and then a big dinner, and then a comfy couch. So. Yeah, I appreciate you guys even taking the time. But Ricky, how do you how do you know these guys? What's your story? You got an you got Instagram? I do. I just, Instagram is Mesquite Thorn Outfitters, name of my outfit service. Um I started guiding hunts right out of high school, my senior year in high school. I did football and started on a cattle ranch. It was a little bit on the entertaining on the hunting side. A few years into it, E. J. and I meet on a ranch about fifteen, twenty miles from my home. Did he uh, mooch a hunt to get into there? No, no, he was actually <laughs> there full time, and I came in to clean up to show wow. these guys how it's done. <laughs> they were the guys with the degree or working on the degree, and mine was hands on experience. But you know, the the passion is really what what kept it in there for so long, or has kept me in there for. And gotcha. you know, a lot of I got questions. He's the guy I call. Really? Uh, I don't really have more questions yeah. these days. <laughs> Maybe if it's about keto. <laughs> 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 yeah, he uh, he watched me eat my fries tonight and uh, she chose, made me feel right? guilty just by yeah. the way he was side side eyeballing me. <laughs> and see, you know, I, I, as far back as we go, it's like you know we used to have like a buffet. Who's gonna yeah. who's gonna top who off? You know, between the two of us, <laughs> it's just, so these the skinny EJ is a different EJ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tell him the other guy was more fun. Er, <laughs> skinny, er, not skinny. <laughs> yeah. EJ is a is a uh, biologist, wildlife biologist. Correct. Right? Right. What are you a biologist too, or you're just you're just? I'm the guy with the uh, hands-on experience and uh, more of the outfit side. I've always been more so on the hunt side of things. Spring and summer, I would run off into the city, do different kind of contracting stuff, but always come back in the season. Now the season's gotten where we're starting late August with clients and running all the way to the end of April with turkey. So oh. yeah, a lot more time committed on the field uh, hunting. Less uh, less playing in the spring and summer, if you'll say. Yeah, it's all playing. It's all playing. Yeah, well, even the hunting side, to me, it's still, I still enjoy it. I uh, haven't lost the fire. I hunt more so with clients, but I have had the opportunity to hunt with my grandfather still, who's 83. My daughter at 19, she got to come with us down to Sonora, Mexico for the first time. That was her first trip out of, this, out of the country. And when time allows, I like to get out there for myself as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Josh, do you, do you, uh, EJ said he fills feeders for a living. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of the opposite. I'm the guy that wants to do hunting for a living or, you know, whatever it might be, whether it be a biologist, outfitter, whatever. But I'm actually, uh, coming from Midland, Texas. If you know anything about West Texas, it's oil and gas related. So, 
uh, I'm in the oil and gas industry, uh, mm-hmm. kind of run a company with my father and have some stuff for myself, uh, with a couple other buddies. But, uh, yeah, the kind of the, some of the stuff we t- touched on shooting today, the just meeting people and interacting. I actually met EJ, it might've been four or five, probably four years now. And, uh, I mean, we've come super close, just a lot of things in common and I actually met him through social media, through Instagram. And, uh, we just talk about, you know, just guys who like to hunt and, yeah the relationships that can start whenever you do stuff like this you know go out and shoot a bow and you know i meet you yesterday and yep. link up we've shot you know two courses and had a ton of things in common and you know see a lot of the same views and agree on a lot of things so but yeah i'm i'm not in the hunting industry so to say i just feel enjoy lucky. i just feel lucky about i just that. i just enjoy hunting i we do have some of our own uh country and you know a couple of different places and i have a ranch probably 50 minutes from my house and you know i kind of we have i'm the biologist there and ranch manager feeder filler and i do that i do that stuff i just don't get that's not my full-time job or right. pays my bills i just have to do it because that's what i gotta do so that's the smart way to do it <laughs> the, the, those of us that jump in it and that's well, I don't know. I do it the way I do it. Yeah. That's not very smart. When it's hot and it's feeling feeder is brutal. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, but it's so, fun. EJ, so how long have you two haven't known each other very long then? Well, I, I think no, it's we like met. four or five years. Yeah, really? we met through social media. Yeah, we met yeah, through I, I would imagine that you guys grew up together. Well, yeah. that like I said, that's a, a testament to just like, like what we did today. Just whenever you go, you know, social media and when hunters interact with each other, I mean, you never know what kind of relationship you can yeah. make and like i said it just like what you're saying is that hey you seems like you've known them forever but you know it's like we've become very close in those last few years a lot of things in common same you know mm-hmm. so yeah, same it's sense easy of to talk crap about social media you know it, oh it is and then you hear stories like this yeah like, and even oh, and even your yeah, friend and, uh, and the, there's there's been things like we've done like you know gone out of town and our wives have been together and they get you know and they enjoy it and it's like a it's a good time, so. I don't get invited because I don't have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's also smart, by the way. I mean, you just take what you get out of it. I mean, you've met a lot of people through social media, and you can take what yeah. the positive out, and then the stuff you don't want, you can just yeah. kick it right back. That's the thing I figured out. You know, it took me a while to figure that out. It was like, if something made me ang- anxi- gave me anxiety or made me mad or just I just didn't like. Yeah. You, you can you can turn that off you yeah. know and not, not so the the last i guess it's been the last year year and a half i've started to focus on the positive what i get what i gain and feed off of from the social media side and i have a whole different look and i you know look on it now mm-hmm. than i did before cuz i had a tendency to look at the negative parts of it you know and now i get excited and that's it's just well, like that's always my interest in EJ is I liked what he did. The negative? You know? Oh, I think actually maybe it was the big stuff. You yeah, there. it's not all but big. It just has to be. And old. that's the thing about me is I'm I'm a people person. Like I'll go up and talk to you, and that's how it. That's how it started. Like you know, <laughs> send him a direct message and. Well, which I'm the op- uh, he was heckling me when we he started blasting me, and so he tried to blast, uh-huh. and he got. His, but that's <laughs> what, but I know him. Like you got to person. Yeah, you got to right? stay. You have to stay on him, or he'll. He'll eat you up. Keep him honest. <laughs> but, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, social media is good. You can use whatever you want. And f- that's that's how you can get to know anyone if you don't yeah. if you don't send them a message, if you don't go up and shake their hand, if you don't go up and talk to them. And it's just like, you know, like I said, I am a – like. See, I'm, but I'm kind of the opposite. Like, I'm like, just shut it off, shut it off. And if somebody takes extra effort to go out, then they get to know the real me. Then I'm like, hey, all right, what's up? But yeah. That's just different. So, be – before social media even started, like, how did who were some of the guys or some of the people that you guys looked up to or followed, whether it was TV or video or magazines or whatever, well, uh, like when you were kids or when you were young? For like, me, to be honest, it was the typical, like, whitetail guys, the Michael Waddells, the Lee and Tiffany's and stuff like that. That's just because I didn't venture out into, you know, I've just hunted. I'd say, you know, I've hunted deer my whole life, you know, and that's like whitetail is, I think, is where a lot of people start, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in no matter what state it is. And then as I got older, uh, you know, started venturing out into other species, animals, elk, mule deer, whatever it might be. And so now I have a different, you know, outlook on kind of some of the guys I look up to or, mm-hmm. you know, some of the different things I like, you know, so. Yeah. I'm almost burnt out on whitetail, so it's hard to watch like whitetail hunting shows. So, 
Yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I still love it. It's like it's it's the roots. It's where we, you know, where you almost start. You know, I can I can remember my first deer this day with a thirty thirty lever action five point, and you know, just things you'll never forget. So, so what was it about what they were doing that got you excited? Was it the deer, just the deer hunting in general, and they just happened to be the ones that were deer hunting, or was it the way that they did it, or? That's all there was at that time. There wasn't much to pick from. For me, when I was younger, uh, I actually had a lot of other buddies that had like nice deer leases, uh, and you know, I I can re- I can I can remember I was like ten years behind the game of having a spin feeder in Texas, and the people that know about Texas will understand about feeders. But uh, my feeders were a trash can with a slit knocked in the bottom on eighty acres that we had, and I would go out there and you know kill a deer you know you don't yeah. get a nice fancy deer lease so when like i said for but for the longest time you know i'd never i killed a hundred inch eight point for my third deer and i freaked out like it was yeah. gigantic i got a shoulder mount this day i was like oh my gosh you know in a hundred inch it's eight point it's like oh my god so watching those shows i mean just killing big deer and then hunting west texas is just it's not pretty country it's yeah. rush it's desert and just kind of seeing that the hardwoods and timber and it's like oh that's what whitetail hunting is you know yeah. tree stands and all that stuff and that's just something i wasn't accustomed to i was the guy that didn't have a deer blind with a trash can and that's how it started for me we had a so. 30 acre lease that we had for one month uh, and it was bow season only so that's why but it was hill country it has a lot of deer but no age shoot does that was about it. What was it that got you into hunting when you were a kid, or what inspired you about? Well, I had older brothers that were 11 and 9 years older. The one that's 11 is really into hunting, and he's really into bow hunting. So I'm older than Josh, so I started, like, with the VHS and the Wenzels, like I said earlier, and watching them bow hunt, and uh, Chuck Adams, Mm -hmm. and then going into when there was just hunting shows that one Sunday afternoon, and it was real tree outdoors buck masters and that was it so it was good no matter what and then um i don't know i just that feeling you get when you're hunting or prepping for a hunt or the excitement of setting up and you wasn't like you looked at it and said oh i just i want to go go on those types of hunts or anything it was just actual hunting well, and being out yeah itself. i mean that's all we had we had deer hunting i mean we hunted outside of san antonio and that's that's all we really had and so I mean, you watch the TV shows, of course, you go to whatever the store is and you buy the camouflage and you practice shooting your bow. But of course, it always changes as you get a little older. Like my thing, even when I got to, I never saw a deer that had more than eight points until I got to college. And so I was in college pursuing a wildlife degree because at that point, the only thing I wanted to do was work on a ranch that had the goal of growing gigantic deer. So I go to a ranch in college, see a deer with a ninth point and start freaking out. Everybody's like, what's up? I'm like, man, I've never seen a deer with nine points. <laughs> so this was already in college. So then at that time, the goal became that I wanted to kill a deer that was, we call it the 100-100 club, a 100-inch deer that was over 100 pounds. Really? Because I had never done it until I finally shot one my like senior year of college. So, and then it always morphs. Like, then it was like a mule deer. I just wanted to see a mature mule deer. So then that became the goal. And then, then... You know how it goes. You kill a mule deer, then you want an elk, then you want an antelope, and then you want a sheep, like, so and then you want an ibex. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's just the way it all works out. But out of school with your biology degree, did you immediately jump into wildlife management, or did you have to go through some steps, some processes? No, thank God. I've always had jobs. a job. No. I mean, I've had jobs that I've really, really loved, making very, very little money. But Yeah, in my field, there's a lot of people that like to have a job like me, and I've been fortunate that the day I graduated college, I guided one last hunt and drove all night and started my next job and then got a job offer for the next job after that and have been there ever since. So it's been good. How long have you been at this job now? 16 years. And you manage a specific ranch and just kind of... I manage a specific ranch for a private landowner and... He likes big white-tailed deer in South Texas. The, the so. job before this one, I was with him when he got the phone call for, asking him if he would come interview because they'd like for him to run this position with Laredo and what got him and his family to move to Laredo. Mm-hmm. So we go back, you know. What did you think when he got the position, got that? Were you like I, stoked I, so, for him? Or? So when I didn't play football my senior year, I went to go work for a ranch uh, in El Indio, Texas, down along a little bitty small town on, uh, along the Rio Grande. And um, 
I worked for a gentleman named Mr. O'Brien, and he was part of a company, SOB Sanchez O'Brien. SOB. I think it was maybe five years later, six years later, EJ got. So I guided all these guys for Sanchez O'Brien. They would, big oil and gas corporation, they would bring a bunch of hunters. When he gets the offer and gets off, he said, that was Sanchez. And I said, hey, when the company split, that was the year I was there. I met a whole bunch of guys. Like, they all left with Sanchez. Apparently, you know, a good one to go work for. Um, EJ went to the interview. And next thing you know, we all came with him. Uh, I always come in there during the hunting season to help with the guiding side. And when he didn't want to deal with the people, I was in there. <laughs> the entertainer. Yeah, I was the entertainer. <laughs> so um, Middle reliever. <laughs> you two are on the same ranch then. No, not no, different. Now. He not just now. he helps okay. me guide, but he helps me guide also. So yeah, same thing. He's, yeah, we have mesquite. He we, does his own outfit. We haven't over. guided to or been on the same ranch for a few years now. I guess we got gotcha. got where you know we're both just couldn't stay on one place. Um, I got I got custody of my daughter almost six years ago, and that had to change the direction on where I could be. So I concentrated yeah. on staying closer to home. That's good. Have you already? Told people where you started getting your inspiration from. No, that, yeah, no? I've told that story a hundred times. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. I like inspiration. <laughs> I like yeah, that. It's always it's Larry D. Jones, Dwight Chu, uh, Elk. Elk is is Wayne Carlton. You know, so Elk Fever when that came out. Burra burra, burra burra. <laughs> and so then, when did it go from Elk, Elk, Elk to <laughs> sheep or for, yeah, whatever? For, elk was the first thing that I started on when I was thirteen, and then it was deer. You know, because there was elk and deer in Idaho where I grew up, and. um it didn't turn into anything other than that until a lot later, you know, I mean, it was still just elk and deer, elk and deer. And then I got into, the, I got the whitetail bug really bad when I started doing the filming stuff and the TV stuff. Cause that was kind of where the, that was where the outdoor market was. was yeah. That's all you saw. If you didn't have a whitetail show, you couldn't get any of the ad dollars or any of that kind of thing. So I jumped into the whitetail world and absolutely fell in love with it. You know, I think I killed my first whitetail in 2004 or five. And then ever since I had a lease in Oklahoma where I was trying to go back every year to hunt whitetail. And then I'm in Idaho where I grew up. I'm like, I was like, there's whitetail here. So I started hunting <laughs> whitetail in Idaho and killing some big bucks. And, um, for a, a good nine, 10 year stretch there, just hunting whitetail like crazy a lot and still hunting deer and elk and that. And then, um, I didn't get the sheep bug really. Like I never really thought that I could hunt sheep until, my, one of my college buddy, Eric Lee at Alaska Adventure Services called me and he says, I just got my outfitter's license. I knew he had been guiding for another outfit up there. And he's like, I got my license. I don't really have time to sell some hunts. Is there anything you can do to help me out to book some hunts and stuff? And so we kind of shared some phone numbers with some different people and turned it out that Randy Newberg and myself were able to, to go up there and do a hunt with Eric and kill some sheep. And like that hunt, I think is kind of what really put me over the top. And now, now it's like, yeah, okay, I want to start killing some sheep or at least <laughs> at least going on sheep hunts yeah know, or on hunts that are that type of a hunt you know and that's probably part of this stuff i like about ej stuff too is because he's like like ibex and tur and you know you've been on a lot of those cool you hunts name it. too well they say the they sheep hunt it. i mean you'll know your first sheep hunt if you're gonna like it or not and so hopefully you don't because it's pretty dangerous place <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, still a mule deer, I still want like that. We were talking about Audad. Dude, I, yeah. I just think I love Jason Odd. I've killed two Audad now, and I want to do it again, you know, and certain things that don't have to cost a ton of money, you know. And Oh, yeah, you can get the same experience at a – Yeah. But a lot of it's just it's just being in that country, right? You know, some people – different people fall in love with different types of country. Some about climbing and hiking and – Climbing and hiking or not climbing and hiking. Yeah. Right? And then when you're from the city, that's what I would always tell everybody. Like, I'd work, work, work. And then I always wanted to go see big country. Whenever I had days off, because in South Texas, the brush is so thick, I would want to go see big country, whether it was New Mexico or Utah or everything. And so you meet these people from the city. And some people, I mean, they think that's the world, right? And I'm like, no, you got to realize how small you are in comparison to the world. So you go out and you see Alaska or whatever it is, and you realize you're just a tick and there's so much more out there to well, even coming here from texas yeah. it's the first time for you and <laughs> to utah, utah yeah yeah uh even driving through new mexico because we drove up here but even driving through new mexico you know i've been in new mexico a ton yeah. uh, colorado a bunch but uh just when you like he was saying when you just get out and then you see like i'm sitting on that you know the archery course today just looking i'm like this is amazing like where i come from you know, there's not a hill big enough to you can't step over. You know, and then when you see these mountains, it's like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I saw you with your phone out quite a bit. You're yeah. taking pictures. So and it's like, oh, he loves it. The, yeah. He's the 
it's cool. social media guy in the pictures and the videos for yeah. sure. Well, the cool part is like, you know, I grew up in the mountains in central Idaho. Yeah. Where you're in the sticks. You're where I live. You're literally within 20 miles of the five tallest peaks in Idaho. You know, yeah. that, that pioneer mountain range right there. Um, or the lost river range there with all those high mountains. So like, that's normal for me. So when I see someone like that, that comes from a different part of the country, like experiencing that yeah, and not freaking out, you know, but like, I mean, just it, absorbing it, it, it well, in. It's an all moment. Well, well, I get people yeah. that want to see a road runner and they want to see, <laughs> they see a cactus and I yeah. had a guy, what's his name? Walters wanted to shoot the dang armadillo. So <laughs> he did. Yeah. So <laughs> that's funny. And you're like, wow. And then you see well, people that get even so like the, excited for of, javelina. Yeah, yeah. The guys yeah. that come down and they freak out over javelina. Right. It's just like, yeah. Just, just because they haven't seen it. Oh, well, yeah. And well, it's like coming from Texas, like, man, these things are everywhere. And then I go to Alaska with my buddy, and he's killed like four or five sheep, you know, and to guys up there, they can hunt them every year. And they're like, you don't really think about it that for them, it, it might be kind of like us chasing mule deer or you chasing <laughs> yeah. whitetail. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. They've done it. Yeah. You know, and then that's kind of their thing. But well, even like BC, they can go hunt a bunch of cool stuff. Yeah, sheep I mean, and bears and moose and elk. Can't, can't some of those guys like in the Yukon and that, they can they hunt stone quite often? Yes, too? they just buy a sheep tag, 80 bucks or whatever it is, and they go hunt either a yeah. bighorn or a stone. Yeah, or like Saskatchewan, they non-residents are not allowed to hunt mule deer. In, is it Saskatchewan? Yeah, they have the Megatron muleys. Yeah. Yeah, and so we look at that as someone that we can hunt mule deer here all day long, but just the thought of if we could go hunting the Saskatchewan or something for a deer that we could get, but it would be totally different, you know, yeah. because it's that, that's, that's how I kind of am now with like, um, you know, we mentioned Pedro or P Pedro. Pedro de Ampuero. Pedro Ampuero. Ampuero. De Am de yeah. I mean, he's killing Ibex and all kinds of cool stuff over there in Spain, just species that we don't have over here. Uh, maybe you guys have them in Texas. I don't know. You guys I, have everything in Texas. Right? Yeah. Like. No, we don't have sham. Well, I don't know. Maybe we do. I don't Probably know. not. <laughs> no. I don't know. We might. We've there. had some friends posting from my hometown that a bunch of warthogs were running down the county roads and. Warthogs. Yeah, they make yeah, they're, yeah they're, they're they're getting out. There's anything street. that's in Africa is in Texas, right? Oh, pretty yeah. much. Oh, yeah. I know they yeah. got the yeah, pretty much. I think there's even are they even bringing rhinos over now? I've been yeah. on ranches with giraffes. Yeah, some in the zoo. Yeah, the giraffes. Yeah, I've sent, been on a few places with giraffes. There. Well, like the scimitar I shot, the scimitar arcs, they don't even have them. They're extinct in Africa, right? Well, there's more in Texas than there they're, is. Yeah, the where biggest population from. is in is Texas. Texas. Yeah. yeah. So where you guys are at, yours is a yours is not a high fence ranch. Is I have both. Three, I have about half. I have four thousand acres high fence and five thousand low fence. What's you, what's you where you're at? I have both as both well. I have high yeah. fence pastures and low fence pastures. That's another thing that we kind of talked about, and the only other time I've really talked about is with Riley Warwood. He does some guiding down there on Texas, and um, where he guides, there's no high fence. It's all low fence. When I went down and killed my first ram with Mike McKinney, my first um, Audad, that's all free range. You know, not even no no fence. Yeah, but Texas kind of gets a bad rap. I feel oh, like. for sure the deer feeders is like a bad rap, and like you talk to like a lot of, the, and I'm talking like a whitetail aspect. You a lot of people from Midwest. Oh, y'all hunt over feed because I have a buddy and that lives in Howell, Michigan, and he hunts Illinois and Iowa, and just a big whitetail guy, and that's kind of pretty much all he hunts. And he gives me a hard time. Oh, you're hunting feeders. Just, you just go out there and it walks right in. You shoot it. And it's like, well, if Sometimes I don't have a 60 acre cornfield, yeah, or soybean, I don't have patch, beans. You know? Yeah, it's like, if you want to come out here to Texas and sit on a trail and try to kill a mature buck, uh, try to pattern, try to pattern them off of yeah, a rubber. Let me know how that works for you yeah. because what they're doing is the same thing that we do. They're pattering whitetails, they're hitting them on their food sources, bedding areas. And, and, that's that's how we they do don't have that feeders. thick brush country we yeah, we, deal with. We that's, don't got river bottoms. That's and, what a lot don't understand is that thick brush country. I mean, it's it's thick down and, there, and, and there's no agriculture down there to speak of. Is there's there? no Are rain. We, it's a desert. Yeah, I mean, desert. there's people that do food plots also. Yeah, you but do, there's food I mean, plots. but but let's say say in the Midwest, you know, because I've 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 had a lease in Oklahoma. I've hunted the Midwest quite a bit. There's always food somewhere, food source, or what? limited timber. Yeah. So there's. Like the deer, you, gonna you narrow it down. Gonna you narrow be. it down. Yeah. yeah, funnels and all this stuff. And well, in Texas, there's no like agriculture. There's no reason for a deer to be anywhere. He could be 15 miles over there. And well, the whole like, pasture should be food if it gets rain. All yeah. the brush, but I mean, when they've researched and they've radio collared bucks, once they get to about four and a half years old, their movement just completely drops off. The only two things that are consistent are feed and rut. rut. So you either hunting food or you're hunting 
Does. Does coming to our food. <laughs> I'm just Does coming to the food. Yeah, no, I mean. Well, the thing about it, we're planting a corn feeder as they're planting beans or yeah, yeah. corn. I mean, it, yeah, they got a gigantic a corn schedule. feeder. Yeah. But, I mean, you could come to Texas and hunt however you want. The thing is, I have a ranch where hunters come and do hunts, and they're really wanting to get a deer, so I do my best. And in South Texas, the best way to kill deer is to have them come out yeah. on a road with usually with some corn that, in it. That's the way I look at it. Like if you want to have the highest opportunity to kill an animal on a hunt that you spend some money on and time off work to go and do, you're going to do it the way that's the most effective. And in Texas, it happens to be that way. Maybe in the Midwest, it happens to be. Well, there's some West Texas country that has some topography. The thing is we don't have topography. You're not going to go to South Texas and glass up a deer on a knob pull a stock off and smoke them. You're going to have to get a glimpse of the deer before you do anything. Like there's areas in West Texas that have some topography and you can Water spot and them. stock them and, and you can glass them. But I mean, and that's, that's another thing about the state of Texas is you can go to South Texas and you can deal like Ricky was talking about earlier, the thick brush. If you haven't been in it, I mean, your hands and knees and you just, it's so thick that really? you just don't understand. And then you can kind of come to where I'm, where I'm at, West Texas, kind of central West Texas. And it's a little more open, a little bit more manageable. Or you can go to the panhandle and it's going to be, you know, open plains. plains and you Kansas. can kind of get into some river bottoms. The Canadian River, it runs up there, you know, mm -hmm. and it can be more of like a Midwest hunt up there. Yep. Uh, and then you can go to the piney woods of East Texas and... But I mean, hunting's hunting. I mean, I've never yeah. had somebody come to my ranch and we do a hunt and then be like oh this this sucks you know like i don't want I, i'm not i don't feel good doing this i mean my deer even though my high fence deer i mean they're wild i mean there's no guarantee that that deer the thing is my boss has put a lot of effort into these managing these ranches so we'll have bucks we have backup bucks and then we have bucks that we don't even know where they come from and they show up and we say he's old enough and hmm. and we shoot them so um or try to shoot them or shoot at them right but i mean Hunting is hunting. I'm not for them to bash or for us to bash or whatever. Yeah. It's all just hunt. Just hunt. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. What are some of the destination hunts like you've done? Like I know you've done the tur, you've done some ibex. How, right. how did that come about? That you did you just? I I just I, I just came up with a list of stuff, and so I had to put a timeline to it and i mean you have a bucket list and it was like mature mule deer then it was antelope then it was elk and then i started researching the whole hunt adventure thing and the first thing i researched for value was that tajikistan mid-asian ibex and so i researched that and i knew it was going to be dangerous and so i waited till as soon as my son turned 18 years old that's the first and i told brian martin who at asian mountain outfitters i told him i want uh, the hardest hunt you have and so I'll never do that again because he sent me <laughs> to an area. And, that, of course, you always play the gamble on you go late and the, you pray the weather's going to bring them down. Well, I went and the weather was horrible and they were still high. So, But it was an adventure until now. I've done some tough hunts and it's it's just like that ain't nothing compared to Tajik. So, so yeah, it was the Ibex and then Tur, which is one I just recently did. And So if somebody awesome. doesn't know what a Tur is, they need to go to your Instagram and look at that thing and – yeah, it's for a cool animal. T U R and it's uh a glorified all dead yeah, on crack. All dead on crack. But it's cool. I mean it's all part of the adventure, yeah. right? The animal is just a small piece. Like the travel. I took two guys that they were went to college with me and wildlife biologists and they were all about the adventure. They finally were like I come back and they hear all these crazy stories and it finally all just lined up and they were like, Yeah, we'll go. I'm like, Okay, well let's go. So that was cool. I had never done it where you go with, we flew together and even the airlines, you get to other countries and that's just part of the problem. And then you get to Asia and that's the other part of the problem is figuring out your gun permits, your rifle permits, the tag, are you going to get your animal, get your animal back, travel, horses. It's, it's crazy, but it's fun, you know? That's, that doesn't sound fun to me. That I just want to, I just want to be flown to the area and then go do the hunt and not have to deal with any of the bureaucratic Mess it almost like seems like a uh, amazing race. That's what it seems like before <laughs> the hunt because it's so many little things that can go wrong as far as getting firearms and, and all kinds of stuff. But it's also when you look at the value of the hunt versus the adventure, everything's gotten so kind of expensive here in the U.S. You can go over there and do a really good hunt for good value Yeah, for in the, the long run. Yeah. yeah, which 
I don't have that much money to just be. I don't think any of us in this room have that much money. Yeah, and, and any you do. He does. He's probably the richest, and then. Is he, is he skimming off the oil, oil yeah. rigs? Ricky. Texas tea. Working, taking bubble baths Texas at 2 p.m. Tea. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of people fooled. <laughs> but no, the next one I have is Mongolia for a couple more Ibex. And that's why I've kind of gone the Ibex route because they tend to be a little cheaper and still have the same adventure. But It's a sheep-style hunt. I mean, it's a mountain hunt. You know? Yeah. To me, I don't think it really matters. what. The, like, I want to be interested in the animal for sure. Um, but not so much as just the countryside. Yeah. Just what it is. Like my buddy Eric, you know, he called me this year and he's like, Do you want to come do a backpacking trip through my hunting area? I'm like, well, just just fly it. He's like, No, 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 no. I want to do a hundred mile backpacking trip in July through my Out. hunting area. <laughs> just wow. so we can go through and and learn this area. I'm like, well, nah, why don't you just fly it? That's probably better. <laughs> he's like, he's like, No, I'll tell you what, you buy a grizzly tag. And then we'll just go on backpack through the countryside. And if we kill a bear, we kill a bear. If not, we just have a, a great adventure. And I thought, started thinking about that. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Let's do that. That'll yeah. be fun, you know. And I remember thinking that when we were on the sheep hunt together. Was I just remember thinking, I'm like, you know, if I don't even see a legal ram or get a chance to kill a ram, I'm backpacking through the middle of Alaska, you know, yeah. through the Alaska That's range. Awesome. This, yeah. is, this is amazing, yeah. you know. This is no greater experience. But then the fact that you do get to kill a sheep, like that's or an animal, like that even makes it that much better, you know. But. That's that's it goes back to like the just being in Utah. Like you can take all the pictures, and you know a lot of people have been to Utah, Colorado. They've seen mountains, but just like when you get in Alaska, and like uh, you know me and two other buddies have got a payment plan on a future twenty twenty one doll sheep in the Yukon, and I'm just show when whenever we we're shooting the course today, and you showed that video of you shooting your ram, I'm just like. I would probably just start, I don't know what I'd do. I'd start crying. I'd throw my gun. I'd start screaming. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's just. He started getting all shaky and getting. Oh, I mean, I got, like, oh. I got. We should have sh- showed thought. him doll sheep videos the whole time. He <laughs> fell apart earlier in the yeah, tournament. Yeah. yeah. Give me your phone. I'll, I'll hook you up with the app. You can watch the whole <laughs> thing. You'll be like. Yeah. Disclaimer. I you won't started sleep. shooting fives and zeros. <laughs> you did. I was rattled. <laughs> I was rattled. <laughs> you I missed the like, fallow twice. Which, just the feel. Like, I couldn't, like, I can't imagine. Like, I hope that's what. I, I hope I get to experience that and, like, get that feeling because I'd freak out. This podcast episode is also brought to you by Prime Archery. Prime bows have some of the most advanced technologies and are backed by the most advanced warranty in the business. Check out the new line of Synergy Logic bows with axle-to-axle lengths from 31 to 39 inches, parallel cams that virtually eliminate cam lean, Synergy grip technology that provides unparalleled balance in hand, the Flexus AR roller guard to reduce side load and riser torque while shooting, and much, much more. Prime bows will make you a better shot. Also brought to you by G5 Outdoors and the G5 lineup of broadheads from the all-steel fixed blade Montec and my favorite Striker V2 replaceable fixed blade to T-Bone's favorite Dead Meat and Waddell's favorite Havoc expandable broadheads. 100% steel, 100% tough, and now with the new BMPs or ballistic match points, tuning your bow to broadheads just got that much easier. G5 Outdoors is an American-made company. G5 products are designed to hunt. Ricky, when you have clients come in and hunt with you, do you have clients that have that type of euphoria and emotion when they get a... Uh, yeah, you know, you still see the excitement. That's one of the big things. Like, I, you know, I didn't come from a wealthy family or nothing and uh, didn't choose to complete the college, but I knew people wanted to hunt and I knew that I could help them get it done. I uh, was able to find, get on some great ranches being from where I was from, uh, word of mouth, you know, the referrals. But that was one of the big excitements. A lot of people, for the longest time, I'm entering year 23 in the industry, they've killed their biggest uh, whitetail with me. I mean, not everybody kills big whitetails. Um, now people are more familiar with the score, and they hear the number, or oh, well, 141 beats a 138. But then you're it, – it just – the numbers – my uncle said it best. He's like <laughs> – he tells me, plus, I don't know about you, mijo, but – 10 beats 8 all day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about this 140, 150. Chingles. Like it's got Chingles a point. Yeah. yeah. yeah today, we, he's like, 10 is more than 8, and I'll take it to the bank any day. <laughs> and, but being yeah. in the business, it's 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 changed. You know, I was uh, feeding protein out of sacks 
we'd have wooden troughs or we just had uh, old cattle troughs that we would use. Now we got these 2,000 pound all weather feeders, feeders you know, two ton wagons with blowers and augers. Um, it's changed. Uh, been very blessed to be part of it all. But uh, you see a lot of the excitement. I think about three, four years ago, I was kind of getting burnt out. Uh, Morris was getting stressed out with uh, personal life things. Mm-hmm. And I, I went and hunted with my nephews or took them out to the ranch. And they would see tracks. And they're like, shh, oh, God, shh, it's right there, it's right there. And I'm like, there's <laughs> everywhere you look, there's tracks, <laughs> right? So I'm like going along with it. And uh, then my grandfather, he's been battling cancer for almost 12 years now. And he says, you know, I, I want a big buck, which I was with him the last time he killed an animal, and I was like 95. So it's been a really long time. And we've made it some good efforts after some good bucks that he's going to really remember um, or everybody's going to remember them. It's, but it just hasn't worked out for us. But um, the Come excitement, on, my favorite is is hunting with my daughter. Yeah. Um, she, you know, We hunted antelope in New Mexico her first time out of the state. We she cheerleading Friday night. We got done cheerleading, picked up food. She showered. We drove like 14 hours. Uh, we hunted it near Santa Rosa, New Mexico. We're back just in time to get her in school Monday oh. like zombies, but we made it back. But to see, you know, she missed a few times and then finally connected on the third or fourth shot and her excitement when she shot her first white tail, her first muley. I mean, it just, you kind of sometimes question yourself as a parent, are you doing right or wrong i'm kind of always the i'm pretty firm it's just her and i but we have a great relationship she still lives with me she's now going to be a sophomore in college but to see other people as excited as like i still get the excitement when i get to hunt i don't get to hunt so much for myself he doesn't he does i get too excited oh i get crazy i mean guiding bow hunters i think is going to cost me some years in my life because it's with the brutal. well, like I, I can. So I shot a big white toe with EJ. I'm the type. It's like, hey, take it, e- take deep breath. You got plenty of time. He's just like, you better not miss. You better not. Miss, you better. Why me shot? And I'm like, dude, back off. I'm like, I put the gun. Up. I'm like, back up. And he's like, what are you putting the gun down for? You need to be like, I like, like to I'm kill. To I like to try to kill the animal <laughs> yeah. the very first chance that it gives you because you never know. That's what we we were on a on a stone sheep target the other yesterday, and we're like. How would you approach this? He's like, I would have been in prone position with a crosshair. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're over here like, man, you never know. But yeah. of course, you could get lucky and it gives you ten times yeah. to shoot it. But so it's exciting to see people's like. It's. Do you ever have people that are opposite that are like just numb to the fact where they're just like they just want to kill an animal and just be done with it or? No, I've never. I've been really fortunate. Like. There's been some bad apples, um, but never that were, I guess you would want to call them, that they were bitter. Mm-hmm. It was more guys that just had a bad attitude and didn't get along with the majority of the group. Or rather, they were stressed out or something Sorry. or just having a bad day, woke up on the wrong side of the bed. But we, most people that came have, that have hunted with us are taking a bigger deer or a better deer. We did have an incident where we had gentlemen killed some big deer with us already. And uh, we had a one wide buck that we thought he would really like. And he's like, oh, no, no, that's not going to score bigger than oh, no. my last one. Well, they wound up seeing that deer and they wanted it, but there was a lot of BS in between and drama. Afterwards, they were like, you know, of course, happy about it, ecstatic. So we kind of, being on on this side of things, I have an idea of what the hunter's looking for. By conversations, of course, or whatever pictures they show you. But when you're, we hunt mature animals. And these mature animals, some people used to say, oh, it's four years old, he's mature. It's proven that some of these deer are getting at their biggest at eight, maybe, I don't wouldn't say nine years old, uh, but seven, eight years old, some of these deer are getting at their biggest they've ever been. Is it genetics? Is it feed? Is it management? It's a little bit of everything. And some ranches are more disciplined. Uh, EJ's got a heck of a program. Um, it's it's amazing to see what's out there and you know age. It's a one thing. So when every time, anytime you take something old and mature, we took a one seventies mule deer this year. I've probably seen fifty to eighty muleys hit the ground, and this one just had the biggest face, the battle scars. I mean, he was just a big old chunky. And 
I've seen a lot of them, and I was re- more impressed with that mm. than he had 170 plus. He was still a nice looking deer, and he was we figured maybe nine years old. Really? Yeah, that that the deer that impressed of all the pictures you guys have been showing me a lot of pictures, doing a lot of bragging this this last couple of days. The Stroke. the one that I liked the most was the the one that he puked over. The, the oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I actually uh, have puked on several. Uh, when you're talking big. about reaction, uh, it's a killing an animal. Uh, EJ's a guy. Uh, you would rather see him shoot something. He gets excited, but I've been around him several times. When other people shoot something, he will jump up, high five you. He I'll might like just be prepared. I'll punch you in the face. Like yeah, whenever, you, yeah, whenever yeah. you know, whenever the guys come to camp and you know, hey, did you get one? Did you get one? If you tell EJ you shot something, get ready because he's, he's going to come at you hot and heavy. He's going to come high fives. He's going to be jumping there. He's going to throw his bow. I mean, it, you know. But if you miss, yeah. I'll be jumping up and down yeah. roasting too. So <laughs> yeah. you gotta, but if you miss or something no, else. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I get pretty excited. I, I don't know why. I, I can usually keep it together until after the fact, but. I mean, I guess that's why. It's just because you love hunting so much. Like, what? What is it? What do you? Where does that come from? Like, why? I have no idea. I I mean, I guess the people that didn't do that, or what? All the people that didn't get like that starved to death a long time ago. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what it is. I just get excited. I mean, other people. I mean, it's just that I have no idea. I, I even since you're little, anything birds. I mean, I was always like, I see people now, and they're like. You're like still doing the same thing you were doing. Like I had my BB gun or I had my little bow and I was putting rice out in the backyard trying to shoot blackbirds and squirrels and pigeons and then it goes to rabbits and then it goes to deer and now I'm doing stupid stuff. So and now he's throwing up. We did a uh, antelope hunt. Matthew drew his AJ son. Oh yeah, he has that celebration hunt. on video. I picked my son and threw him up across the and, pasture. Uh, I vi- I went along to videotape. <laughs> that was over the no. Well, he drew it, but it was DIY. Yeah, DIY. And we almost had it done the first day. EJ and I, of course, you know, we go back. I'm like, no, he's a shooter, dude. He's like, no, he's busted. And I'm like, no, the the goat gets probably 110, 130 yards. And then. EJ's like, oh shit, shoot him, shoot him. <laughs> but that so time then we lay there. Really... So then we lay there for three more days. Yeah. I had drawn that tag before and kind of knew where they were. And it's a public land antelope muzzleloader hunt. And yeah. so antelope are running all over the place, getting shot at by people with muzzleloaders. Yeah. We literally so... laid there on the same rock for three days. What? And we see this goat coming from like 1,100 yards. Antelope, they're not goats. Or antelope. Yeah, we call them goats, yeah. <laughs> from like 1,100 yards, and we're kind of like, yeah, I'm like, the oh, dude, he's good. Oh, no, no, no. Bronx so when he, the one his son got were the last morning, which is I think like Monday morning. or Yeah, because. I think we had it. It was the toes We were going to hunt till noon on the last day. And uh, a long walk to our, our rocks. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting there kind of resting, waiting for the sun to come up a little bit more. And. EJ kind of, I don't remember exactly, gives me some signal like, don't move, don't like, move. Don't turn and on he's your like, camera because he had a video camera. I'm like, don't move. Th- this antelope is less than 20 yards walking at our feet. We're all facing, let's say, oh. north, northwest, and he's directly behind us. He probably got about 80, 90 yards. And by that time, I had, you know, had EJ was a little wider, so I had a good <laughs> – I had a good blocker for my camera. Free keto, free keto. I got He's to, wearing camo yeah. too, so it's like a big Yeah, yeah. I got, so I got my camera in position. By the time he looks at me, I'm like, I'm already recording. And uh, his son makes a great shot and probably runs 30 yards, drops. I mean, the three of us, just a celebration. We're jumping, screaming. I'm sure people heard us miles and miles down the road. And uh, for me, you know, we've had a lot of hunts together with guests. Uh, we've gone on several trips together. He's been there for my first muley. Our first hunting, or my first hunt in Colorado, was with him as well. He'll go, and if somebody don't want to go, I was like, I'd go with him. Mexico, we did that together. But to be there with him and his son, I remember Matthew being on his lap, like in two thousand four, and missing a javelina. So now we're over here in northern New Mexico hunting public land, and he shot a stud of a antelope. But to capture that moment yeah. with now, we've now been friends sixteen, seventeen years. Um, so to be part of that moment, that's always been a special one for me. Yeah, that'd be cool. Wait till you, EJ was talking about he can't wait till he's his your grandson. grandfather. Yeah, yeah, your grandson. Yeah, no, he's I like, mean, you go like that's we're talking about how everything morphs. Like it goes from like I just want to see a mature whitetail to now this, but now the windows I can see the window of where I want to do what I want to do, limited by 
hopefully my grandson wants to hunt and wants to go to the outdoors and it's going to be that's the one you can really spoil right i tried not to spoil my son too hard because everybody says oh you ruin them or you gotta whatever, make sure whatever. they turn yeah, out right. yeah no well you kind of want them to want it and have some desire to do it on their own and i've seen people you talk about earn it not being satisfied and it's usually when the parent makes the kid or whatever yeah, and they really don't want to do it six years old and he shot a 280 inch deer yeah yeah, yeah, yeah whatever so what, but what, oh, go ahead. no but as far as yeah now i see that window where i can see my grandson in a couple few years and it's going to be whatever he wants to do that's what i'm doing and hopefully it's hunting you know so yeah you kind of touched on that, like when you were, uh, I'm talking to Josh, when you were um, a kid and you shot your first buck, you know, that little eight-point buck or whatever else. Yeah, like, well, it was the first the one was first. a five-point, but the first legit 100-inch eight-point. <laughs> eight yeah, you're like, Jack, wow, wow. And then there was that kid today that drew that tag, and I can't, I can't remember. I, I kind of got what it at the end. If he had killed an elk or not, and you're like, well, what kind of elk are you looking for? He's like, oh, 330 or better, you know, or whatever. I think it was 340, yeah. I think, I think sometimes these – kids coming into it like maybe we're not doing them that much service because yeah. coming into it they think it's uh I, it's easy well, to kill 180 inch mule well the next thing he you said know. after uh you know I've, i'm going for a 340 type bull is oh when i was 14 i shot a three i've already shot a 300 inch bull. A th- yeah something and i and i don't know if i was talking to you or someone but it's like if i saw a 250 inch elk bewing i'm gonna go nuts like yeah i can Talk a big game, like, oh, I'm only going to shoot. But that's the difference. That's what's uh, kind of Like me, about. I just get amped up in the moment. And, like, if there's a big old 250-inch bull and he's bugling at 30 yards and I got my bow. Yeah, but these limited entries, Nevada and Utah, that's what's kind of well, That's what bummer. makes it hard for you me. You get like, the tag, you, and it's like you waited 14 years for this tag. Yeah. Like, and that's the pressure you see. Poor people, like, and you hear everybody, you're like, oh, dude, you better go 350 or bust. 350 or bust. You just drew that tag. But, and it's like, well, I, who I don't care if I shoot a 350, you know? But then so, he's disappointed if, he's the, if, if it's, it's the last day and he has to shoot a 5x5, five five, you know? And then he's like, yeah. oh, I wasted yeah, the yeah, tag. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, that's, that's, that's the pressure that you that's see a lot man. That's like, but you could get tags. You just buy my main thing is shooting <laughs> mature animals. <laughs> yeah. As long as it's mature, I'm good. I already, I mean, yeah. I, I didn't have a. Going back to where it started on the hunting side, the TV shows, like you said, you know, Buckmaster, Realtree, but, you know, Hank Parker, Bill Dance. I was fortunate to work on a hunting lease where Hank Parker hunted and Dale Earnhardt Sr. hunted. Forest Woods of Ranger Boats, I got to hunt with him. That was pretty cool. I was probably 20 years old, 21 years old. And um, I finally, you know, years later, got in a position where I could afford to go and we came up to Utah. Utah's a special place to me. Jen and I came up here. We're still friends with the guys that um, we hunted with. We actually had lunch with the gentleman today. Um, we kind of all keep in touch as much as our schedules allow. EJ and I more so. Um, we just kind of do a couple events, uh, 3D shoots, archery shoots. Um, not much hunting. We did do British Columbia a few years back. Um, but it was the, the, the big whitetails. I lived in a small town in South Texas and a couple of feed stores, convenience stores. You'd have these guys roll up in these big old trucks, big old racks. And knowing that I couldn't afford them, I was like, but I could go find them. Like, I knew I could go find them. And how would you find them? I was like, well, get your butt in a deer stand or corner a whole bunch of roads and cover ground. Yeah, but then it was big bucks. But it was like a big buck was a big buck. And then it became to be... Oh, big buck is a 140, and then a big buck became the 150, and then it became, and then, it became, and then we kind of created that market now where everybody goes score. He's a 130, like a kid 340 bull. I'm like, yeah. Well, I mean, well, I mean, it's in for score. me. Still, the drive is that I enjoy to hunt. Taking an animal for me is is a blessing in itself. But knowing being in the industry, I'm familiar with score. I can throw the score out the window, and if it turns out to be world record, phenomenal. If it turns out to be, I'm targeting when I go on a hunt, I'm hunting for a mature doe. Yeah, as long as she's mature. mature. Two point. Yeah. Not, and I I've shot some monster two muffin. points. Uh, yeah. Over the limit. Carrot cake. I've right? shot some monster two points, and uh, looking for mature is the main thing. And taking any representation, it I could, this is ecstatic. You know, I uh, we did a red stag hunt in New Zealand. I didn't shoot the biggest one of the two, but my smile is just as big, if not bigger, than his. 
his smile's bigger than yours because he knows he beat you then. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Let's see, that's it happens. Like uh, I think it was two years ago, EJ invited me to go hunt mule deer in Sonora, in Mexico, and uh, I went again last year. And last year I was lucky enough to kill a giant. But uh, one of the bucks I killed the first year when I went with EJ is just a big three by four. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to kill three big bucks mm-hmm. there in two trips. Uh, I killed two on the same trip with EJ. But my favorite buck is actually the one that scores the least amount. Really? Uh, and he's just a big, gigantic, framey, desert mule deer three by four. Yeah. Uh, and just the look of him and just. And he was actually the first one I shot, but scores cool. Like the the big one I shot last year, yes, he scores a bunch. He has some extras. He, I mean, I love him to death. But like, the, <laughs> that's why he's dead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. no. But you talk about the score or even trophy hunting, and that's kind of even be frowning because I mean, there's certain. Well, if I go down somewhere every year, I'm not trying to, or if like like I'm going to Sonora, Mexico again this year. I'm not trying to, oh, if it's not this, I'm not sure. If it doesn't have this many points, if it's not, I'm just looking for something that I like. I like. I'm not like, okay, is that, so I don't like him if he's, if he's 180, I don't like him. He's got to be 190 or he's got to be 200. Yeah. And see, and I have a client There's that's a like that. that. It's got to be, I mean, he's he's probably got 8 to 10 200s now, and he's, so he's being really picky. Um which is that's fine. You know, yeah, it's kind of tough to yeah. deal with at times, but you know, we, actually, we don't hunt no more. He's since moved on to do other hunts. <laughs> he's gotten into the bears lately, and uh, it's just. I mean, I think it's different for different people, you know, and at different stages in life and different things. Um, if if I like for me for whitetail, like I've killed a lot of whitetail, nothing huge, but nothing, but I've killed some some good ones. So I'm I'm probably gonna let you know certain deer go by that i would would normally have been excited about elks kind of get into the same mule deers kind of so the things that i've been able to hunt consistently and a lot of over the years those are the things that i'm like a little bit more picky on but it's never based on a number for me it's based on just the wow factor or the size or like i killed a bull three years ago now in idaho that is in like a 360 frame but he's only got three points on one side. You yeah. know, he's missing oh, yeah. missing his both of his yeah. brows. He's only got one brow language. on the other. Oh, yeah, yeah I'd like, be all over that. He's a freak, uh-huh. you know. Um, but maybe some guys would be like, I'm sure some guys would look at him and be like, oh, this bull's not going to score for nothing. I don't want to kill that. Kill well, here, here's like what I would say, like a prime example of where the score, the number, it plays a factor. Is like I said, my ranch is in West Texas. They hunt South Texas, mm-hmm. you know, the Golden Triangle, the Mecca of Texas hunting. Big South body Texas. deer, it's a totally yeah, bigger different, deer, different species, strain. Right? Yeah, better habitat. Uh, yeah, better forage, better habitat, mm-hmm. and they can just do better. Uh, I, my biggest whitetail free range on my ranch today is a hundred and sixty-seven inch deer. I would watched for three years with my bow. He's he's a whitetail that scores one sixty-seven. Well, if you go to some, you know, down South Texas, you know. That's not going to be – I mean, it's a big deer down south. Right. Don't get me wrong. But that's would be the equivalent of me shooting like a free-range 200 oh, yeah. in south Texas. You know, 187. I've been hunting – You know, I've been hunting over there for a long time. I got another buddy uh, who's hunted west Texas. His dad's been on this ranch since the 40s, and there wasn't even deer. He's 15 miles from me, and there wasn't deer out there. And – uh so a hundred and sixty seven inch whitetail in West Texas, I mean, I've only I've only known of a couple of them. Mm. So but that's a that's the score and that's a number for the whitetail, you know. Right. But, but that's all like, that's all talk about hunting private land. I'm not even about trying to hunt private land. Whatever if DIY. It's not public land <laughs> if, over public, the counter yeah, public DIY, land DIY spot and stop. Then it doesn't count. Just hunt. Hunt it. If but you that's don't like it, sc- don't do it again. And the experience <laughs> I had on that deer and the history I had with him far outweighs like what the oh, score yeah. is the score yeah. is awesome i mean i i, I score every animal uh, i fish i if i catch a big one i weigh it to the yeah. right down to the mark and it's like i like knowing but that's not so i've had very very few animals that i've put a tape to very I've never, few but I've it's never those really, that i that i that i know are big that i'm like yeah i wonder how just how big but yeah. most of them i'm like it's a 140s class or it's a 150 class or whatever it might yeah. be you know? if you look at my wall all the mounts on the business end of it they would all be considered management mm. but 
95%, 98% of my guests that have been to my house and see them. Like, oh, wow. Uh, that's their, oh, this, wow. This was a goal I set a long time ago, like a long time ago, uh, was to shoot a mature Pope and Young White toes on my bow, 125 or over. Right. And I grow, and I, I've, I've never entered anything. Uh, I just and I grow score everything. I think yep. if a if a deer grows it and he grows it, I think that's how many inches he has. Mm-hmm. That's what he scores. So every s- score I have, I don't have any net scores. I don't officially do anything, but like I set a goal is like every year I want to kill a mature, you know, Pope and Young White tail. It's like a goal. So that's, that's, that's the only reason I kind of score. Like I, if I think it's one twenty five, I'm I'm out there taping them. You know, <laughs> no, it all it all depends on the area too. One of the the lease that I had in Oklahoma, it was at, at first I just wanted to kill. An eight point. You know, I wanted to kill a good buck. And then it's like, oh, I want to try to kill a 10 point. Or, you know, I like this chocolate buck that I found last year. I wonder if he's still here. Or big eights. For me, it's big eights. Like, I freaking love big eights. And I finally killed my giant big eight three years ago in in Oklahoma. What did he score? I don't know. I didn't tape him. I didn't (laughs) tape him, but it's because he's a freaking giant. So what if if somebody were to tell you he's 124, would you be disappointed? If I were to guess, I would say he's probably in the 50s, maybe high 140s, a little more 150s as as an eight. Big, mature, heavy. Now, 140s, eight point would be equivalent to the odds of producing one's probably equivalent to a 180s typical 5x5, would you say, EJ? Heck no. Uh, No? It'd be like a 170s. So he's cool because in his horns you can see where – you can see the the um, veins, like from the briars or from the. Oh, he's got holes. Looks or? like barbed wire or something with the scratches in his horns from where he's rubbing and stuff. Oh, like okay. it's all he's got all the cedar in the base of it, but his horns are literally dug in, like like it looks like he rubbed on barbed wire or or something really thorny. But he's just had a ton of character. The first day that I was there, and, and that was the same year that I killed that big odd dad down there with Mike McKinney. Okay, as I did the road trip, I drove to South Texas. Killed that odd dad, which and that was my second trip down there. And then I drove to Oklahoma and stayed there and hunted. And and the first night I saw this buck from a distance, I was like, whoa! And then I actually missed a ten point that would score higher than this buck, but wasn't as big of a frame in the first night. Well, then I repositioned to go over to where I can we talk about the miss? What, what yeah, was no, no, on no. There? the miss. I whiffed it like what? eighteen yards or something. <laughs> right there, it's on camera. It's on. It's it's one of the like perfect. I had the camera set on slow motion, high speed, so you, the sun is perfect, the lighting and everything, and you can just see that arrow just whoosh, and the deer just drops right under it. Like it's beautiful footage, beautiful miss. Beautiful and then miss. Yeah. and then so then the eight pointer. So then the next day I'm over in the other tree where I where I knew that I could get on this this other big eight point buck and I have video footage of him I'm filming him standing under my tree stand feeding under my tree stand as he's going through and it literally took me another eight days before I could finally get this buck killed and um, it was just like it was like everything that I ever wanted in a deer it was just a giant giant eight point and that ironically is the last time I've hunted whitetail like that was the last trip that I've been on huh like I actually but, I have. I mean, I've killed one trophy whitetail, but I have some big management, like super trophy giant management stuff. But I have a deer that scores 113 shoulder mounted. Yeah. And he's super compact, but he's like 12 years old and just gnarly and nasty. But I'm kind of weird. I like the gnarliest, nastiest. Yeah. Like my competition was weight minus score. So you wanted the biggest, heaviest buck that scored the least in order to get positive yeah, points. Buck. My, my brother calls it the siren. He's like, if the siren goes off, I'm pulling the trigger. He's exactly. Like, I, I don't care what it is. If the siren goes, it goes. Yeah, I can feel that. You start feeling that. Yeah. EJ's beat. boss took a monster eight point probably 10 years ago now, eight years ago. That wide 160s, the Loma, what would you, what'd you call them? Which one? Lomas or Backstrap? Of any. No, Backstrap, yeah. No, he shot a bigger one. He shot a 170. Since then? But this one was, I mean, he was, I don't know, 27 inches wide, something like that, scored in the low 160s. And we would see this thing, and he'd be like, what? As an eight-point. Yeah, and he'd turn around and just be a, we were. But big, heavy chocolate. Everybody ride. was waiting for this buck to get taken. And it, he had, I think he took him two years before he finally got him. Yeah. Wounded him one year, shot him high with the bow. That's why I got his name. Yeah, that's why he called him backstrap. Yeah, and uh, luckily it didn't affect anything on his growth. Two years happened. later, yeah. he, he took him down and he's a stud. We had a gentleman coming from, where was he, Mississippi Joe or Arkansas? He comes in, he says, I want one like them. He's on top of the fireplace. So does everyone else. It, yeah. Do. He's like, no, I ain't going to shoot nothing else. I want one of them. And, uh, Is that your Mississippi accent? Like, we, we don't, well, whatever accent. It was 
They was the Mississippi <laughs> Joe. What was his name? But Wait, what he meant by English and what he meant by I want one of those was he want something outside the ear tips. He wound up shooting like a mid to high one twenties, a eight point that was like twenty two inches wide, and he was ecstatic about that. Yeah. But when he pointed at a one sixties, twenty seven inches wide, we're like, those things don't just grow on trees. Which I'd rather <laughs> shoot a narrow chili head. <laughs> yeah. But so that, I guess the one sixty eight point would be more equivalent to uh, a one nineties plus. Typical yeah, I, I think it all has to it all has to do with your experience, your desires, what what gets you excited, where you're at. You know, like in some places you're probably not gonna the trophy the potential or whatever is not there. But it, you just have to do it as an individual. Look for what you want as an individual, and whatever's gonna make you happy and excited about it, and not compare that to what other pe- what makes somebody else excited. You know, that's what was, just like going back to the first deer I ever mounted was a hundred inch eight point. And, yeah. The ex- like how excited I was, and that's how I still get. And it's like it's a. You see, I see that somebody had a, like a spike mounted, and it's like, man, it's kind of like. Yeah, I mean, oh, we still talk about some of like the first ranch we worked at together. We seen there was one three point. It was just massive, probably nine inch spike on one side, and the other just had a little two. And we were like, work. Well, I mean, who's come on, boss? Who's, who are you gonna let shoot that here? And they don't let none of us shoot it. Uh, and then there was another real old buck. He was a five on one side and just a solid one on the other. And uh, I called him OG because he was, you know, had just had a limp and he That's was just, he was just struggling to to get around. Not old enough. And those I are like some, those are some of the bucks that we were, you know, big on our hit list. <laughs> <and we still laughs> like chat himself. about the old enough to vote. Yeah, yeah. that deer's not old enough. You just said. That's a, I think young. that's a six year old deer. He looked right, young. I think that's six year old. I won't shoot a six year old deer. But in Oklahoma. Northwest Oklahoma, where I'm at. I wouldn't go to Oklahoma. Yeah, you that's know, the you difference. Just, you, that's you just miss a uh, <laughs> we had a guy from higher Texas. scoring five by five, and then the next day it's like not this year. He'd never be a five. We had <laughs> no, a guy no, but I'm was, talking about the day before. So the next day you're like, no, I'm shooting. <laughs> no, that deer is massive. Basically, yeah. he uh, he was on my buddy's lease. My buddy had a different lease up there, and there was a group lease. Mine was individual. It was 300 acres. It was just mine. Like I I. I didn't want to have to deal with anybody else. I wanted to bring my family members if I could or any of that kind of thing. And I brought some guests, but we had a guy from Texas. He was a biologist as well and into managing deer. And he leased this property in Oklahoma and he was on it for five years and he never killed a buck. His goal was he wanted to kill 170 type deer, six or seven years old, manage it kind of like Texas. And finally that, that last year I was up there with him at dinner. He's like, I'm done. There's, there's just, it's absolutely impossible. He says, you might get a freak deer, Every now and then he's like, but up here with the genetics, the hunting pressure, just whatever it was, he says, I can't, I can't grow a deer here unless I have, you know, 10,000 acres or 20,000 acres. He's like, it's just not going to happen up here. So he, he pulled out, you know, but yeah, the acreage is supposed to be three to effectively manage it. They say 3000 acres. Yeah. So, cause that's about a big, is the deer home range. Cause for sure. it just depends on what the limiting factor is. It's, it it's either on, age. A lot of places country. it's age. Yeah. Like, Bucks are just not getting old enough because the food is there, Iowa, wherever, all the Midwest. But Texas is food because we get yeah. live in a desert. So and where I'm at, it's like water. I have, like I said, my buddy's ranch is just down the road from me. Uh, it's thirteen thousand acres, and we got pictures of the same deer at the complete opposite end. Uh, you know, each section's really? a mile, so those deer. I mean, there's it's Six crazy how I, far. I took an eight point this year. Um, he was kind of a regular, but I was be, by the time my schedule allowed me to get back in there. Wound up hunting him. I saw him right around Thanksgiving. Wound up shooting him. I think like the second week in January. Total of thirteen different days. Did you say he came sits. in a bunch of times? You just couldn't get it done. Or well, what? I had it on day nine. I really had. I was videotaping <laughs> it, so I was trying to get good video, and then he moved. Little, so those cameras, little bug fun. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's what it came down to. Like I said, I. This day and that's it. After that, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up the rifle. But he came in right at dark. I said, you know what? I told my daughter. I said, sweetheart, I'm gonna stay one more day and I'll be there. We'll go do lunch. So I stayed the next morning. It just changed my whole approach about the way I had been doing it every time. You kind of do a little something differently. We have a lot of wildlife, a lot of animals, whether it's deer, hogs, javelinas, turkeys. So when you put feet out, you can't just put a little bit of feet. You got to put a whole bunch of feet out there. <laughs> Armadillos. But you got to. Yeah, South but at the same problems. time, like they already know at the end of the season, it's dry. They're they're going to come to the feed quick. Mm-hmm. 
and you're still trying to get in your pop-up line. So I got there, put all my stuff in the pop-up line, feed, go ditch the truck real quick, jump in there before anything gets in. And like within five minutes of sitting there, he's the first one that shows up with three does. I didn't worry about the camera then. But what I was getting to before taking him, I think he was like on day eight or so, I saw him six miles on the other end of the ranch. Hmm. He was cruising within 200 yards of being in the neighbors to our our west and that's when i said i'm not why am i sitting here hoping to shoot him inside 20 yards when he's six miles away. he was like 5.6 miles what we figured uh maybe as a crow flies a little over three and a half miles four miles um but you know i'm i'm here sitting here for him to come getting these 20 yards out of one window Luckily, day thirteen. Day thirteen. Mid, mid, you should have uh, shot him the first time you saw him. Yeah, yeah well, I should. I could have with a rifle. Would have been done in a heartbeat. Mm. You could but, have had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with. But you I, my like, <laughs> my goal as a white tail hunter is a one seventy plus with a bow. Um, I'm sure if the right one sixties came along, I would. <laughs> I would Make fun of people that like. Why are you number, talking about no, score? No, I thought no, score didn't matter. One sixty. Why is well, it just because right no, the bow or book deal. But not, I'd go after a big eight point, a big nine. Don't don't get me wrong, but my goal is a one seventy. Always have that plus hope, with the bow. You know, to for something, but. Um, are, do the mule deer down there migrate, or are they residential? Like, do they just kind of stick to the same area? They don't migrate. They just, they just they rut. Just They'll there. move to rut. Yeah, I guess. But they're they're closer to him to Midland. I went up and harvested that one up by hen, which is eight hours for me. So, oh, yeah. gotcha. The the, the they buck, don't migrate up there, do they? The buck he threw up on. Right, yeah. that was that he was puking on. That happened to have eleven inch bases, ten and a half, eleven inch bases, Disgusting and super gear. heavy, and over three hundred pounds, and extras. And if EJ were to draw one up, he would probably draw that draw one, one like that. So that might have been some of the because he literally like okay, yeah, the deer look cool. He shoots it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Excited. Well, you know how it is. The ground shrinkage or when you walk up on it they're different well as soon as we walked up on that sucker i mean you could see the mass and that's i mean that's so, whenever i that video i showed you yeah why did he start puking that's what i want to go because he I, saw I think it's he an saw, adrenaline dump i don't know i yeah, had it before because I, I shot something i shot a i shot a big mule deer in colorado with my son we threw a mean stock and it was like boom i was there and i told my son i was like i think it might be over he's like what i was like i used to throw up when i got excited and i shot a big deer and then it was like <laughs> never mind I spoke too soon so we actually had a thing called a puker like if somebody did see a big buck and they'd say it's a like was it a puker and I'm like, Damn, <laughs> but what was funny is because like i said we're celebrate like no, like normal celebrations and then whenever he walks up and he sees because you got about the second half of the video before i can start gotcha, recording gotcha. so you just got a snippet of it but Literally, we walk up there, and it's dark by the time we get to him, and we get light on him, and he sees those bases, and just, like, out of nowhere, just starts his throwing up, gagging routine, and me and another buddy of ours that we're with, we just, we're looking at each other, dying laughing. (laughs) It was hilarious. I'd love to see Yeah. We're like, what is going on? Who does this? Mm. And, like... Most I didn't people, even know he was a puker. That's most people do at me. <laughs> but it was a, it was technically a call buck. So yeah. I mean, but I'd rather just do that than kill. But something. most people but I'll see their animal go up and too. grab it. He went the other way, gagging, throwing up. So I knew he was dead. This podcast is also brought to you by Onyx Hunt, creators of the most comprehensive digital mapping system for hunters. Download the Hunt app from the iTunes or Google Play Store and use promo code SOLO for your 20% discount at checkout. Also brought to you by BlackOvis.com. Search the word Solo Hunter to see all the great Solo Hunter branded gear that they carry. Link to my recommended product guide and gear list. Order yourself a custom built arrow setup from their custom shop or just browse the website for all the latest gear. They do range though. Uh, just for the fact of water and feed and then where some of them live we have a ton of oil field so if you know one year you might have you know a lot a lot of country that's untouched and then the next year you're gonna have an oil gas come 
company come in there, lease it up, and start a drilling program. Pads and everything. Starting putting in pads and roads. Well, soon, you know, with any kind of wildlife, as soon as you start getting any pressure, they got to go somewhere. Yeah. So but this was more rut related. Well, this buck had just, I had actually was going in to hunt for another buck that he had seen as technically a cold buck. And this buck kind of showed up a couple of days before I got there out of nowhere and it was in the area. And so I got lucky. But they don't like when you talk about like high country mule deer, like getting pushed down from weather, you know, they're up above timber and then weather brings them down, 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 down. These deer don't change like weather related. I mean, they just have a big range. You know, they gotcha. just the yeah, uh, desert deer are pretty nomadic. Yeah, I would assume nobody's ever done any radio. There's call no like stuff. super. Well, it's, we we have. I mean, there's deer. You'll you'll catch them. I've heard, I've heard stories. I, I have don't have experience myself with the trail cameras, but I've heard stories from guys that are rep- like Jason Carter. He was talking about a buck that they were hunting that would kind of do a circle. I mean, it was going. There would be like between sightings seven miles between different water holes where he would go and he was using like two or three different water sources in this huge span and this is in the summer you know late summer when yeah, deer don't, aren't supposed to move you know? yeah well that's i think like ej said best there's just the texas mule deer and we have a couple different like we have like a transpacus mule deer transpacus it's they just don't get very big they're smaller bodies just they're just not like these other deer. They're 300 plus pounds. They're, yeah, like they're more Kansas. like a desert. Yeah, they're, 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 no, they're desert like a mule deer. Well, they're not Kansas. desert. Mule are big body. They're like an eastern Colorado. A lot of Colorado. people think deserts. Yeah. We call, the we call, our deer into that. Our desert mule deer, they're not very big body. They're no, small. No, see, ours yeah. are big body. What we take well, down in not Mexico. in those hard country. They're not that big body compared to Gaines, the soft soil. Yeah, like where he and shot his buck would be more of like a Colorado, like a northern Eastern. I think an eastern deer. or a Kansas Colorado. It looked like, I mean, it looked like a deer, that, a mountain buck to me. Well, like lot. the base of his neck, like where a taxidermist under his was like 25, 26 inches. I mean, Jeez. just gigantic. And then, like I said, if you kind of like from where I live, if you go south, southwest, and uh, a little bit southeast, um, you like kind of I like the hand signals there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, you got to listen to somebody. if I don't if I don't put the hand signals, then I don't know which way is southwest. And somebody that talks way. with their hands and with their head. The listeners listen don't know what they're yeah. missing, but it's good. But there's a there, we call them like transpacus mule deer. Gotcha. They're just they're some small like we have hill country white tail we have south texas white I think, tail i think it's all genetic too i mean even even in idaho in the mountain country those those deer that i've been killing the last been lucky enough to kill the last several years with my bow is they're small they're small bodied you well know, they're thin horned small bodied older deer but from they the just s- don't get real big the but same there's not much to eat the same the guy i was fortunate enough to shoot a buck with him as well and uh the first, I guess, legit mule deer hunt I'd been on was in Sonora, Mexico. Uh, yeah, I've shot some of those transpacus ones, but I mean, they're just Transient tiny. Mule deer. They're, yeah, they're tiny. But when I walked up on the one, mine was the same way as his. He was ancient and just gigantic. Oh. And like those Sonora, I mean, they're big, but they're they were nothing like this because I've never killed one like up in Colorado. I got a hunt this year in Colorado, but I've never killed one of those gigantic yeah. body mule deer. So seeing that. That's cool. Cool. Well, guys, um, you kind of, you didn't blow my theory out of water or whatever, but like my, the whole premise behind my podcast and how I want to do it is to talk with regular guys. Like you guys are far from regular. Yeah, by means, irregular. But to not, you know, not focus on what people within the industry are looking at, looking at those of us that are in the industry without saying, oh, Without just interviewing a bunch of professionals or quasi professionals, yeah. or whatever else, like you guys are professionals outside of the hunting industry, but you like hunting is your life. I mean, you hunting is your life. It's, it's your how livelihood. We provide for hunting our is your life. It's your livelihood. You know, right? Josh is a little different. Hunting is passion, a passion, I mean, just, recreation. Yeah. You know, um, I'm just wishing I could. Don't, dude. Don't. No. <laughs> yeah, for me, I'm lucky. I learned how to get paid in the industry, and then yeah. learn to. You know, but it's through the outfitting side. You're not getting like a rifle company or a shoe company or. A... Yeah. I'm not trying to get that. I just. Wanna... But it's a job, you know. You could be, you could be, you know, plumbing or, or an electrician. Oh, I get some offers. Any of that kind of stuff. I get some offers to but... go take uh, and, and it, and to get money. Yeah. Um, they know I'm trustworthy, dependable, and reliable. But I like to hunt, yeah. and I'm fortunate. I get to earn a paycheck and. I get to do it with my daughter, my son, my grandfather, myself. 
the fire's still there. And yeah, so it's like. So I'm like you, Ricky. I, I dropped out of college after one semester. I was like, this shit ain't for me. Well, man. I did a couple I half semesters. Uh, I didn't even do that. <laughs> one semester, 1.9 GPA. I was like, uh uh-uh, this is 1.9? You know, yeah. I was a dummy. I was okay, but that's another thing about EJ. He didn't want to do it. He's a genius. Oh yeah, he's super no. But I smart. went to college for he's super eight years, smart. but just to get my he's got a undergrad. photographic memory, and he's and that's, I mean, he's yeah, a, he's one of the guys. Okay, you know, he does he rose, but like whatever. if you're in any kind of group, text message, Instagram, instant message, whatever. I mean, he's gonna grammar Nazi you. I mean, he's gonna correct you. It just correct. Could have showed me how to turn AirDrop on my phone. Yeah. today? Just, yes. Okay. I yeah, mean, he's, a, he's, he's, he's tech. He's uh, very intelligent. Well, smart. I was going to be an English major. Big reason I why I got to where I'm at <laughs> is, you know, having him as a teammate and having pick up the phone, uh, you know, lives and families taking us in opposite directions at some times. But we have, you know, I would go to his son's baseball games and football games when they were in the area. Uh, we've, you know, our friendships have been proven for such a long time, but the it's the hunting that that's what brought that's us. The bond. Well, see, and that's, yeah, I'm a big believer in like you meet certain people for a reason. I I needed the job. I was a young dad, it's not going to college. I needed the job. Like you had a great referral, got the job, and uh, I think one of the things that you know, we had a lot of guys that would come in, had the degree, but they didn't have the field experience. I knew what I was looking at because I'd seen a lot of deer in my days. Rather, it was at the convenience store, at the walk-in cooler, at the feed <laughs> store, and that, or in you the know, spotlight. Like, we had a little twenty-seven acre <laughs> the ranch, and they, and they sold it. To, uh, my uncle mine was his buddies, and they sold it. So I would go country cruising on the weekends and afternoons. I'd go put some gas, and I had to drive around see if I could go see deer because I was curious. I've um, been very fortunate to be on some of the best ranches South Texas has to um, to this day, and some of them are. I mean. At the top. Oh, but he had talked about, well, you said blowing up the, po- like messing up the podcast or blowing up the podcast no, no, as far no. as being not pros or not. What? So w- the way I want, the way I wanted to do my podcast from day one right. is, is never to be that, you know, we're the leading authority. Let's teach people how to do things. Let's teach people how to kill big deer. Let's teach people how to shoot the best bows or whatever. And only pull from the, the knowledge pool within the industry kind of thing. That's typical what you hear of a lot of a lot of podcasts or whatever. I wanted to approach it with the fact that of people that I'm inspired by, regardless of who they are or where they're from or or, or without any well, personal connection whatsoever. There's one there's one thing and there's one word, hunting. Okay, and then you take hunting and then for instance like me, I can meet guys from South Texas. We have something in common. I can come to Utah to an archery shoot, meet you from Nevada and hunting kind of you know the northwest and we all we have something in common and we over oh, inspiration and then you look at i mean you can just look at like, well, like who you follow and i bet you we probably have a lot of people that mutual yeah we follow the exact same people and yeah. then you go to him and you go it's pretty same much the same yeah, yeah i mean I, you i bet you it's 30 percent probably yeah that's but it's but, just how you filter what you think is entertaining or what you think is good content yeah, well, for me, I, to me, I'm not as, as concerned about the content as much as what fulfills me. You know, like I get really excited to see guys like your success, where it's like, you know, I can I can maybe look at a tur hunt or, or an ibex or something like that because it's attainable by the regular guy. It's something it's it's achievable. You just have to make some sacrifices and work towards it. And nobody's handing me handing you anything. You know, it's not like you got this. Yeah, that's you know wealth behind you or or oppor- oh, an overwhelming amount of opportunity behind you. You're making your opportunities happen. You're taking advantage right. of it. You know? Hustle, and he it's does called, make his opportunity. It's called hustle. It's yeah. hustle. Yeah. Yeah. He gets his hustle on. That's I, one I thing that's that. he, that's one thing about me and was appealing about EJ just getting to know him over these last few years and getting close is just the dude is just knowledgeable. Uh, no matter what it is, what not only what county, what state, what country. Yeah. Like but I the, won't lie to you. Dude, like on, some on people ask me a question, things, and I'm like, I don't. I'm like, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't know something, I'll tell you straight up. Well, I don't and, know. And the and thing is, like, he can kind of be dry. Okay, because for instance, what? my first trip to Sonora, Mexico, mule deer. Uh, if anyone's priced, them, salty. They're not cheap. 
and it was kind of a it was a it's a stinger in the hunting budget Mm -hmm. and uh it was kind of a i kind of went last minute the first trip and i talked to and i just you know i always kind of lean on to ej's i mean he's a as far as hunting goes i mean he's an influence to me for sure uh and first like i asked him like dude you know because there's a lot of money i'm like should i go would you go and he's like yeah it's good go I'm like all right come on give me some more i need i need some more comment but i've learned is like if he said if he says go saddle up and go and if he goes and if it's not good or something he'll tell you know he'll tell you that's what i was getting at when i said you blew my not my theory out of the water but you blew like my initial my initial impression out of the water was the fact that um his camera shy. So. I was just figuring you. I just figuring like I didn't realize oh, so how think? many people you know within the industry too. Oh yeah, yeah guys yeah. that I know that are within the industry. How connected you might be. Like that never crossed my mind. What crossed my mind was I like I like what he's all about. I like how he the presents content, himself. Yeah. I like his content. I like what he does. Not knowing anything about you, and you know, I knew that you followed a couple of the same people. Tim Pask is a guy that I follow and really like his content. I, I knew that you two were kind of connected. I knew you and Brendan were a little bit connected in, in a way, but like not how deep. You know, I just found out today that the, all the Prime guys. I mean, I've been with Prime for ten years. You know, all the Prime guys. They they've been hunting with you. They do all this stuff. With you know, <laughs> like, you know yeah. Steve Walters. I just did an interview with Steve Walters a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's like. <laughs> Your way, that's where I say you blew my theory, not my theory, but kind of my first impression out of the water because um, I yeah. didn't realize that. He's a secret is groupie. Cool. He's a real groupie. Yeah. No, I mean, I just, I just don't. I'm well, not going to like, hang out with somebody to post a picture that I hung out with that person or whatever. So that's why a lot of people don't know. But a lot of people that you mentioned don't do any of that stuff either. So right. you don't know until you talk directly to the and people that, they talk to. And that was like, like I said, one of the things that was appealing to me about EJ was – like my, I have a stepdad who I've, you know, has been probably the biggest blessing to me in my life. He got me in the outdoors. Like he took me as a, I remember my first hunt, I was eight years old, had a single shot 410 and it was a dove hunt. And then after that, you know, he just, he got me, he's, he got me into hunting, but he's not the guy like my dad's, he went to New Zealand with me and that's probably the biggest, craziest thing he's ever done. He, he's probably only killed. I got him into bow hunting at like we got our family ranch and I like I have I got him a crossbow and drug him out there. Mm-hmm. It's like the roles are almost reversed and like he 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 like I'll take him out there and oh man I saw a bobcat come to the feeder I love you know he just he likes seeing, he's not the big hunter he got me into it he's you know he's in the I mean he likes the outdoors and he got me into it but as a kid I I did it all myself you know like when I go back to like the feeder like when I shot that buck I, he was parked at the gate and i shot him by myself he heard the gunshot came pick me up and he goes the only thing i could see was a little kid at the end of the road jumping up throwing his hands in there so he got me into it he fully supported it and but like i said he never went and bought me a deer lease i've never had uh i kind of joked today i set up a rifle blind at a ranch it's actually the first enclosed rifle blind i've ever had in my life and i kind of set it up because i got uh you know two younger sons and it's kind of hard to get a two-year-old and a four-year-old in a bow blind (laughs) so now i got a i got a legit rifle blind with windows and insulated and carpet i'm like i've never had one and like i said for the longest time i was behind the curve on like spin feeders like i had a trash can with slits in the bottom so with ej you know he's kind of like the older brother i never had or like you know not that i was so like i did everything myself (laughs) self-taught so with EJ, like the knowledge he has, man, I just, I'm attracted to it, drawn to it. And like, just want to pick his brain. Cause I'm learning. That's, even, you know, I want to learn. That's even more of a connection. Like I'm the exact same. My brothers and I were all, I mean, obviously you have some mentors and people that help you get into yeah. it, but you're cruising around as a bunch of 12 and 14 year olds chasing deer. Like you're, you feel like you're self-taught, you know, self-educated on the hunting side of things. In my area. family, it's brown. It's down. It jumped yeah. the fence inside our 27 it's but, think, yeah. but, think, but things have changed i mean back in the day there wasn't so much like you were I hunting mean, for food and whatever no i mean as far as influencing like yeah. as far as the tv i mean i had uncles that i mean i thought they were the best hunters in the world yes your fam- they were yeah close, and then as i get back older and i go hunting with them i'm like oh my god you know these guys are terrible are, <laughs> but see back then there wasn't now you get people that are experts and it's just like 
horrible. Like no. Well, well what makes a person an expert? It can be. Yeah, that's the thing. Nothing. You have to you have to filter to what is really going to help you and what's not and what's no. bull and. Back so, then, we just had real tree outdoors and buckmasters. Going to Josh saying he used to do it on his own. I started driving like the sixth, seventh grade. God, I, 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 Sixteen we had a, in the seventh. Yeah, we were a little bitty town. <laughs> we're, we're we're a little bitty town. Now I know why you didn't finish college. And, uh, Sixteen and we, we seventeen. We had a nineteen seventy nine hatchback Mustang, and my stepdad, he's a, the the bookworm. You know, he's an indoor guy, and he would go hunt with me, and I would go load the rifle, and he'd be like, "No, you can't do that. You can't do that." One day, big old buck steps out. Uh, gun wasn't loaded. Tried to load it. Phew, he was gone. So he never hunted with me since then. That was so I started driving myself. So I would shoot deer and I would load them in that back of that hatchback yeah. Mustang by myself <laughs> <laughs> and haul yeah. them into town. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, my brother. He still makes fun of me because he has vivid memories of me taking the Volkswagen Rabbit and turning it around in reverse so that I could back it up the hill because then it was it had more power to go yeah. up the hill bouncing up over <laughs> when you're kids like you just get by and I, I think it's kind of like i even look at my son you know he he did his first hunt this year he killed a turkey and a hog and it's like well what does dad do because dad's proud dad you know has some connections so dad hooks him up with some nice boots dad hooks him up with some nice clothes he worked for it you know he put in his hours but it's like I, you know he's got his own little ruger, ruger american 243 rifle that dad puts his old vortex scope on it you know i mean the kid's got He's got more better gear than I had in my 30s. Oh, you know? yeah. my, yeah. I was like hunting in my same 30s. school jacket because that's the only jacket I had. Yeah, we had like a what family I, rifle. I, would, him. I ruined my kid. We had a family <laughs> rifle that you, uh, you know, would just lend from uncle to uncle and go yeah. borrow, and it was a 243. So ours was a lever action 3030. Save me 3030. Uh huh. Yeah, my first three or four deer lever action 3030. Yeah. But but you look at him like as a dad, and, and, if, and if you can do that for your ch- child, I think it's okay in that, but. I almost kind of think like because the way we did it seems to be all all similar, you know. It's like we feel like that's the right way, you know. That's <laughs> how everybody should go through that trial by fire, you know. Um, but I think where we're at in the industry too, uh, it's it's a different ball game. My daughter, with the ranch we had in Sonora, Mexico, has got a five star lodge, so she got to she's had a couple experiences in five star lodges because some of the places we have in Texas that we hunt as well. Um, you become friends with the landowners and always so welcoming to invite my daughter. They've always appreciated the the relationship that we have. And my part there is like we're blessed with an opportunity and we're just simply enjoying it and capitalizing on it. What I would have thought 18, well, probably at 17 I did because that's when I was already in the industry. So I kind of saw where if it's just happening on one ranch, it happens on a lot of ranches. But you know, thinking that we would be on the other side one day as the actual customer or the guest. I always thought, you know, I'd be the employee, the guy that in this skinning shed, the guy that just does the feeders. Landscaper? Yeah. Well, I wasn't <laughs> too good at the landscaping. Uh, <laughs> but I was. Uh, Bill would, Munoz, no, I would ask the questions. A lot of grass to mow into. Yeah, I would ask the questions about the deer and kind of, you know, go pick up sheds, start measuring them because learning, like, you know, this is what they were looking for was bigger. Um, so, you know, Nobody my son mentioned video games yet. Did anybody play video games? I, we Dude, I a did. Gamer. I was not a gamer. Yeah, actually, I had a not at all. BB gun. I actually played yeah, video I'd games. I'd be out there with a BB gun. Yeah, but you're like 15 my, years younger. <laughs> no, but I played video games in my late 20s. I mean, I did the right. duck hunt in the Nintendo, the, the duck hunt one. <laughs> I did that one. We didn't have that. No, we yeah. had Pong. So it was the Unison Pong. So we just <laughs> literally slid the remote up and down to hit the ball back and forth. But I mean, I was the same way as EJ, like putting the rice in the backyard. I mean, when I was little... We actually See, we couldn't throw rice. We'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's dinner. When I was little, we actually lived in town. But and uh, hunt people over the. I've rice. always lived out in the out in the county. But when I was little, I don't know how many windows and stuff uh, like come knock. Well, your son shot a window out. My grandparents live at the edge of the city limits, and my mom, I don't know, was like four or five years old. She buys me a Red Rider BB gun. It's the Ridge. the line that comes into the Ridge into the power game. line that comes yeah. into the house. The there's no little I don't know what kind of bird it is. Let let up on you. <laughs> First shot at ever shooting a bird with this Red Rider BB gun. Pow! My mom and grandma were like, we just created a monster, it's right? And we you didn't killed her with the first shot. Ed, yeah, first yeah, shot right. ever. Uh, and EJ <laughs> see me, I'm a terrible shot, but I got that one. It's the excitement. I'm on paper. I'm great, and he's seen that too, but. The buck fever, 
Uh, you know, I, I get the shakes at the best of them, and that's one of the big reasons to, I get to come back. My daughter, her bigger biggest white tail, she was sitting on my lap after she or she's telling the story. She's like, I can feel my dad's legs were shaking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, no, I think it, I, you know, I've always said that I, I'm a big believer that you can't compare yourself to others for sure. You know, I mean, Wiseman said that the comparison is the thief of happiness, right? If you're comparing yourself to what other people are accomplishing or able to do, it's, you're going to just rob yourself of any, any amount of joy that you could have on your own. And I'm a big believer in opportunity of chance, you know, taking advantage of the chances that might come before you, a big believer in opportunity of circumstance. So whatever circumstance you've worked hard to put yourself into that circumstance, and now that I've met EJ, I'm going to add a third one to that, and that's opportunity of hustle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. hustle. I mean, I, I also, I mean, like when I have these hunts, I mean, when you do like how you get the draw tag, and you draw that tag, and it's automatically like looking at maps, looking at videos, trying to Google this unit, this time of date, weather, whatever. But I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm super. See, I just call EJ. Yeah, like, I, I just text. call my yeah. brother. Yeah. yeah, and you just, like, I mean, I, I, a lot of these hunts, I, I look at so many YouTube videos, thank goodness they're out there because I hate doing videos, and it's like when the hunt actually goes down, all the scenarios and how you envision it, it's usually something close to how I kind of envisioned it was going right. to go down. So it's almost like doing it over again or seeing how it went down. And, like, I watched every tur hunt video on YouTube probably four or five times. and All pay, two of them? Probably or Pedro's. Three. I bet you I watched Pedro's every time I got on the Stairmaster. Really? So that thing was crazy watching it all go down. But yeah, you know, you talk about preparation plus opportunity yeah. equals. That's so, awesome. But well, guys, being lucky helps lucky, too. Opportunity of luck. Being yeah. lucky is a big one. Being blessed and lucky. And he yeah. is super lucky. We're all super. blessed. We're all blessed. But we've been on hunts sure. where we, we don't take animals. I mean, it, it it's reality. But you hunt, it's hunting, not. Yeah. Not killing, rather you're in the game fence or you're out. And that's not what EJ said today. He said it's killing. It's all about. Yeah. Killing. No, I've had good hunts where I don't yeah. kill. Yeah, we <laughs> but No, well, guys, I appreciate it. It's getting late. Um, cool. Thanks for taking the time. I was I was almost called this off just before dinner because I was beat. I didn't yeah. think that I had it in me, and I'm glad we didn't. I'm glad we <laughs> ate some food and, and did it. And uh, hopefully our paths will cross again. We'll be able to do it again sometime. Sure. For me, it was great to meet you. I. Uh, while I was over here with Pasco was talking, I uh, found you up on uh, Instagram, so I'm following you now. I didn't follow you before, but it's been great to meet you. Yeah, and, you're probably uh, following that other guy from South Texas uh -huh. that, lives in, that goes to Laredo all the time. You're probably yeah. following the wrong dude. The wrong team. Yeah. You think he's that's not Tim Pass, dude. You know that right yeah, now. That's, that's not, that's Tim, not Pass. Tim Pass. Yeah. Yeah. We're built the same. We're built yeah. very similar. You know, I've, you know, I've yet to meet all Tim, gut, but, no we, but we get to chit chat through uh, you know social media and yeah. made a lot of people through through ej that are you know you just have a common interest is yeah. the hunting side and the fact that you know we spent it's some people want to say it's about the score but i think it's more the time that's committed on the field in the field mm -hmm. that that's what people recognize because yeah. it's a lot of time away from your family it's 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 besides it being a passion you're truly committed to this outdoor industry uh, a lot of times sacrificed away from your family and Luckily that they still support us and love us. I I just want I want people to live free and you know live have an exciting life you know have a fulfilling life and be able to experience a lot of things. For me, the mountains does it. You know, the mountains and the countryside. Does yes. It, so. What, what kind of sure. feedback do you get from your your followers, your your listeners? What is like the message that you get from them in, in general? Um, I see like a lot of kids who want to be the the Insta fame, the TV yeah, famous, yeah. don't want to put in the work. Yeah. Like, well, it looked great in the picture. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I get that because I think, um, I just don't relate. Like I'm not, I don't put myself out there as a, as the public figure or the celebrity type, you mm -hmm. know, I honestly, the biggest feedback that I get is a lot of thank yous, you know, thank you for putting out content, the same type of hunts that I do stuff that's real you know thanks for thanks for publishing a no-kill episode those kind of things and the it's more the relatability factor i think you know um i can do what you do and i think a lot of us because i'm a short fat 
guy. You know, yeah. like, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah, that's, that's mine, my man. thought too. Hey, if he can oh, do it, thanks. I, yeah, right. Can I afford it? That's a different one. <laughs> yeah, and well, and if you look, until until the last recent years, the hunts that I've done are over the counter DIY general. You know. Mm-hmm. This year, I didn't draw a single tag. They're all over-the-counter hunts. Not yeah, easy. I've been goose eggs. Yeah. For... And I've gone on some guided hunts, you know, and I now have been able to do that dull sheep hunt and, and Texas a couple of times, you know, but I've done that. We talked. I've done that very, very frugally. So I think it's the relatability factor that the average common dude can can, can do anything that I've ever done, you know, and that I've done a lot of broad things, New Zealand and white-tailed deer and just if EJ can do it, so. almost anybody can do it. You just got to, you just got to want it. Set your goals. You got to want it and stay focused. Yeah, but I don't fit the mold of most. Yeah, you got to hustle. Not at Opportunity all. Yeah. of hustle. Brown heavy hustling. But if if you're a good dude, or you're a good person, you meet good people. Those connections go. You guys are proof of that. A great solid friendship. Riley Warwood is one of my best friends in the world at this point. He and I met through the hunting industry, even just out of photo shoots, taking pictures. You know, then we hit it off. Yeah. It's, who says how you can meet someone and become close? Yeah. You know, whether it be a handshake, social media, or however it might be. You know, it's like yeah. You never know who you're going to meet and you know how close you're going to get. We'll be close so. to you. I got a big family. My younger brother. We're just we're just the closest because we have that hunting bond. You yeah. Know? And it's it's hunting in the outdoors that can create a bond. And I'm sure if other people have interest in mountain biking, you know, the mountain biking community or the climbing community, CrossFit, CrossFit yeah. community, they all have this religious keto community thing that they follow. Yeah. yeah it's like for me, the hunting Ketards. side of things. When every day the opportunities and going after them until you finally capitalize. There's highs and lows. But it's like anything else. You don't just go for your first interview and you get the job and you go fight for your first promotion and you got the job. I mean, there's going to be a lot to nose, but you keep grinding, you keep grinding, and they're going to pay off. Yeah. It's about capitalizing on opportunities. Sometimes you get lucky. Um, you know, it's capitalizing on opportunities. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Any other thoughts? Any other ideas? No. Guys, thank you very, very much. I, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, no, very likewise, welcome. man. It's been Last enjoying. couple of days yeah. have been fun. Like I said, this was about like we had never seen you, met you, cross paths, and you know. I'm I was sure, a fan. I'm sure you were. You didn't. You played it off pretty good at the first. You're like you. Oh, maybe I follow you. Maybe I don't. Oh, and then you're like, <laughs> you killed a big odd dad with Mike down in Texas, didn't you? And then uh, you killed this. Like, I just don't like to. Like, flat- he's been on my page. I just don't like to flatter oh, people because I have a, a I have a pretty good memory, so I see it and people get like they're like, oh, he's talking. I'm like, no, I'm tell you, he's like, a groupie. Oh, this it. doesn't show it. Well, I mean, just like these last two days. I mean, we had talked about the Axis Hunt. Yep. Uh, next year, you know, possibly yeah, doing that next well, year. I was thinking, love that. Yeah, yeah so I'm excited like, about that next weekend. Yeah, so oh, yeah. and yeah, Ricky's coming to us next weekend, but that'll be good. If it doesn't conflict with anything else that I've got going on, for sure. And then, like I like I mentioned, I'm probably going to be going to the Texas Total Archery with Prime yeah. too. So we'll I definitely there. want to connect with you guys. Oh, that's a fun a one. Days, we all so. get together in San Antonio. Everything's so close together. You he knows to we've been with him for two days. I know how cool <laughs> they are. <man. laughs> Yeah, but you fly to San Antonio. You fly into San Antonio. Yeah, for yeah. it's probably less. You than would. We drive. For it. Maybe I'll drive too. Yeah, they just got to go down the block. Yeah, bring a vehicle because yeah. you got to haul back all Hell that. Hell no, I'm not driving that. I've done that. I've driven to South Texas twice. I'm never gonna do that again. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I want to do total archery again here next year and um, Big Sky. Yeah, just you make one trip didn't out of the walk. The knock on course today. You can't next year because you'll be on that Axis hunt next year. If it falls, if on it the coincides, they they if, if bounced, it doesn't coincide. Count me in. They bounced our Texas dates around because we missed another Axis hunt because the but Texas these guys dates got, they could work. They, the they've been out. bouncing back the Texas dates between like late April, early May, right? Early so May, yeah. Hopefully, these well, guys, you got pull. Tell Sean, dude. I'm good. Any of those times, I'm not. I'm just hanging out with my kids during that time of the year. I don't work. I only work like three months out of the year. Oh, it sounds like yeah. Josh. <laughs> no, as far as uh, who? Josh oh. only works depending he, on what He was mad yesterday because he was, you know, he was dirty from his ankles. I was like, man, you look dirtier at uh, a, a 3D shoot than you do at work. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of Ricky and he's, I'm pretty and, handy. And he's rough naked, he says. He's rough naked. <laughs> yeah. No, I give him credit. He is. I mean, at least on his videos, he looks like he's pretty handy. Yeah, I want to see more of those videos for sure. I'm, I'm Only the solo ones that don't have the tripod legs. So <laughs> fear legs. <laughs> All right, guys. Cool, let's, man. let's kill it. Thanks. Sure. Have a good yeah. one. Thank you so much for listening. 
Thanks again for all the continued support, and please be sure to email with your questions or comments about the show, and hit that dang subscribe button and leave a five-star review of the podcast. As always, stay humble, stay safe, hunt happy, and get out and find your wild.